I'm honored to be here, especially um, and delighted that you've taken the trouble to come and listen, particularly on this beautiful afternoon. Let me tell you a little bit about the genesis for this project and what I hope to accomplish this afternoon. About 10 years ago, I was working on the problem of climate change. For 20 years, I'd been a student of innovation. And I was intrigued by what it would take to move the economy to be carbon free. And I helped to edit a book on the subject called Accelerating Innovation in Energy. And it was quite clear from that early work and remains quite clear now that the single thing we could do to really accelerate a transition to, uh, to carbon free energy is to impose some kind of tax or price on energy. And many of our colleagues have written on this. And I became obsessed with the question of why business was not advocating for such a tax. Because it was an elegant solution to a difficult and complicated problem. It would head off untold damage. It would create significant markets for renewable energy, and it wouldn't cost that much. And I thought, and this is 10 years ago, why doesn't business just get together and advocate for something so sensible? So what I'm going to talk about today is the result of really 10 years since that time, trying to understand whether and how business might be able to step up to some of the big challenges of our time in productive and useful ways. In particular, what I'm going to do is talk you through the structure of a course that we teach at the Harvard Business School. The name of the course is Reimagining Capitalism, Business and the Big Problems. I apologize for the title. We were trying to fill seats. Um, it's essentially a course about what can business people do? Motivated, concerned business people, what can they do against the big problems? And we focus particularly on two big problems. The first, as you might guess, is environmental degradation, particularly global warming, but also the poisoning of the ocean and the water supply, the destruction of species and topsoil, the, uh, the poisoning of aquifers. And um, the second big problem we focus on is that of inequality and social injustice. And we ask, if you're a business person, what can you do? And notice that I frame this deliberately not as what should you do, but what can be done. And in the course of that conversation, I open up the idea that, and this is really the crazy part, that purpose-driven business people might be critical catalysts in driving the system transformation that we need in the next 10 or 20 years. That business people who are motivated by a deep desire to do the right thing and to act with integrity might have an important role to play in shifting the entire system. Now, let me highlight just what a wildly unlikely idea this is. It's, um, it's unlikely for a number of reasons. The first is that the big problems are, by definition, enormous public goods problems. The way I explain it to the students is we say, you know, there's me right now, and there's us later. And public goods problems are us later problems. And when we think of business, we don't immediately think of it as an us later institution. In fact, there's quite a lot of evidence that business is like really, really good at taking care of me right now. And so why would we think that business was a useful instrument? Secondly, the idea that purpose-driven business should have an important role to play uh, provokes sort of howls of protest on both the right and the left. So the right says, this is simply woolly-headed, muddle-headed nonsense. The purpose of business is business. The social responsibility is to put your head down and make profits. And any muddling about larger issues is just muddling, dangerous distraction, an excuse for crony capitalism or for spending money on your own business. On the left, people tend to think that business cannot be trusted. I have many friends who are dubious about the entire idea that purpose-driven firms might even exist. The idea that business is like in it for themselves is so deeply ingrained and backed up with so much convincing data that the idea that A, purpose-driven firms might exist and B, they might make a difference is like, whoa, you know, at best that's greenwashing and at worst it's just a rebranding of getting business into government and mucking things up. So we already face a sort of 
significant threshold. So I'm going to try and talk you through the following idea, which is first, that I completely agree that business is a hugely unlikely solution to the problems that we face. That if you ask me where is our best hope for significant social change, I would turn to Danielle's work or Marshall, uh, Marshall's and talk about the importance of civic society, of organizing, of the rediscovery of democracy, of well-designed public policy to my colleague Bill Clark. You know, what are the policies we need to really support um, a just and sustainable society. That feels to me clearly first best. I got interested in this not only because I was stuck in a business school and heck, what else am I going to do, but, um, but because it seemed to me that alas, the odds of the kind of broad scale social and political change we would like to see are small. That our governance institutions are under tremendous threat and that part of that is the result of the way business has been systematically caught up in the intellectual project of denigrating business and its importance. And so it felt to me that this agenda, thinking about purpose-driven business and how they could help the big problems that we face, might be helpful, might be part of a broader coalition. So that's the overall framing. I have broadly four ideas I'd like to talk you through. And you should know that this is a 28 session, one and a half hour course, and I'm going to attempt it in, let's see, 40 minutes. No problem, right? Here we go. Um, four ideas. First, I want to present to you a theory of change that is driven by self-interest. That is, I want to make the argument that it is in business's self-interest to fix the big problems, and that one can imagine a sequence of steps that could engage the private sector community in actually taking these problems on and making a difference because it's profitable. First idea. The second idea is that although I myself have talked myself into believing that this is a plausible theory of change, it remains wildly unlikely. Uh, I taught for 21 years at MIT where I was the Eastman Kodak Professor of Management. That was a coincidence, but it turns out to be wildly ironic because that was the, the structure of my research. Danielle indicated this. I spent 20 years working with large organizations trying to get them to change. I was with Kodak when they went down. <laughs> I was with Nokia, trying to persuade them that Apple was really something to pay attention to. I am deeply familiar with the barriers to change that exist. So I believe that even if there were, and I'm going to argue there is, a convincing economic case for business to engage with these big problems, that would not be enough. Indeed, I have lots of reason to believe it's not enough. That in fact, one needs to add to that this notion of purpose or values driven. And so the second thing I want to talk about is why might purpose-driven firms be economically viable and why might they play a critical role in driving this transition? And the third thing I want to talk about is a whole range of legal, normative, practical constraints that people often raise when I talk about this and suggest that to at least a first approximation we don't need to worry about them. So that's where I'm going. So let me start with this idea that there is a business case for business to save the world. So let's start easy, with the easiest part of this. Let's start with the collective case. I think we know, and there may perhaps be development economists in the room who know this in spades, that the private sector is much better off when public institutions are functioning well. I read this as the core idea of much work in political science and history over the last 50 years, and following the dramatic collapse of the Russian experiment, a core idea in economics as well. The idea that the free market alone can give you a functioning economy, let alone a healthy and just society, is one that I think has been widely discredited. So we can think of the work of scholars like Duran Asamoglu or, uh, uh, or uh, Douglas North talking about the importance of inclusive or open institutions. 
So in brief, for those of you who don't know this work, the free market, I believe, is one of the glories of modern civilization. A reliance on prices and a decentralized information structure makes things extremely efficient and extremely innovative. So I teach at the business school. I'm in some respects an unabashed capitalist. I love free markets. But we know both from history and from the economics, from the math, that free markets only work their magic when they're properly controlled and constrained. So they have to be genuinely free. Everyone has to be able to play. That means everyone has to be able to play. It's not OK that there are large sections of the, of the population that never get a chance to engage. And prices have to be free and fair. So everything has to be properly priced. So a world in which firms can make money by generating negative externalities, or more colloquially, throwing my carbon dioxide out of the, wi out of the window and my waste into the river, that's not a free market. That's not the free market that we celebrate as the driver in prosperity and freedom. That's exploitation of the commons. And so as we think about the evolution of the Western project and um, more broadly societies, this need to balance the power and dynamism of the free market with strong institutions is, I believe, quite well established both historically and, uh, and to some degree statistically, although we can talk about that. So I'm going to suggest that the private sector as a whole has a compelling economic interest in making sure we deal with some of these massive externalities. I could talk in more depth about the likely cost that the destabilization of the climate is likely to impose on global supply chains, on agricultural productivity, on political stability. More colloquially, I usually say, like, it's not in the interest of business to toast the planet. It just isn't. Similarly, it's in no one's business interest to create a significant angry underclass, a group of people who cannot find work and feel shut out and angry. The whole mission of business is to provide jobs and opportunity. If there's um, a significant blowback against business, and I need only instance the uh, rhetoric around the recent election to give some sense of how potentially dangerous this sort of a reaction can be. And we can look at what's happened to the private sector in Venezuela and what, what might well happen in Turkey as an example of this dynamic in action. Populism is, in general, not good to what I think of as the free and, fi and, the free and open market. It's good for some firms. We tend to call those crony capitalism. Uh, but for the bulk of people who want to play and participate, it's not good at all. So I'm going to argue there's a collective action. Now, those of you with business backgrounds, and maybe all of you are thinking, well, that's really nice, Rebecca. You know, yeah, there's a collective action, but there's a collective incentive. But that and 25 cents will get you a cup of coffee. Uh, you know, to tell a business person that, you know, the whole, the private sector has an incentive to respond to education and health problems and rebuild democracy in America and solve global warming is like, nice, but I'm busy. And you should know that I'm very sympathetic to that response. I sit on two large public boards. Um, I've worked for many, many years inside organizations, and I'm deeply familiar with the fact that real firms face very serious pressures all the time to put their head down right now and make money. They're pressed from the capital market, so they have investors who say, if you don't have the returns I want, I'll find someone else. And they're pressed from the product market. So you have to be making profits, otherwise you don't get to keep playing in the long term. So as I tell my student, we have to find a way through this problem that preserves the, day, the profitability of firms. Or as managers, your first duty is not to crash your firm. You've got to keep making money. That doesn't mean you need to maximize returns every instant at everyone's expense. It does mean that you have to be able to convince the capital markets you know what you're doing and at least survive in the long term in the product markets uh, with competition. So we need a theory of change that allows firms to, uh, to start making money from, these, uh, from this change that's coming. So let me suggest a three-part process. And you should know in the course, we do this in a seven-week block. And I'm going to do it in five minutes. So if you're interested, you know, ask me. But I want to give you a sense that there, is an ec there might be an economic pathway out there before I start talking about purpose. So here goes. Step one, 
individual firms can make money by addressing the big problems in the context of their own business model. This is sometimes called shared value, sometimes called stakeholder theory. The idea is that thinking about the world in a more holistic way, understanding the needs of multiple stakeholders might be just a better way to run the firm. And for some firms, this does appear to be the case. Let me give you concrete examples. The most obvious is the opportunities um, opened up in reducing energy and water use. So a firm like Walmart, which is, as you know, uh, the largest private organization in the world, is deeply invested in reducing energy and water use. I do believe they are purpose-driven. We can have a very interesting conversation about that later. But the economics of what they're doing are very compelling. KKR, that well-known tree-hugging firm, I don't know if any of you know this, but this is kind of a rapacious capitalist on steroids. Every time they buy a new firm, they put in a team to take down water and energy use. So that we believe that you could get as far as 25, 30, 35% decarbonization simply on, on profitable projects. The opportunity is that large. In the social arena, the uh, business cases tend to be less clear cut and are most, uh, most uh, obvious initially in the consumer goods segments. So let's uh, talk about something like uh, Lipton Tea. So Lipton is owned by Unilever. They sell 30% of all the branded tea sold in the world. Some years ago, they decided to move into sustainable tea. Why did they do that? They were afraid that they would run out of tea if they didn't. They're sufficiently big that they knew what was happening to the supply chains and wanted to act. But they were also concerned about potential damage to the brand if they did not, and brand advantage if they did move first. So you're seeing some segments of the world, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing, some segments of consumers really starting to care about what firms are doing. If you think about the scandal that engulfed Nike after they were discovered to be using child labor, this would be an example. So firms who are deeply engaged with their brands and the potential for brand damage often have an incentive to try and fix things as long as it's not too expensive. And the good news, or the heartbreaking news, depending on how you think about this, is all of this is not that expensive. We can build a just and sustainable economy. We have the money. It's, uh, it's, it's small at the edges. Um, but you have to be able to get someone p to pay for it. So I could go on. I could talk about potential shifts in regulation. That is, if you anticipate that the regulatory regime will shift, it becomes um, it becomes advisable to start to invest in doing new things. The most dramatic recent example of this is the collapse of the market value of the European utilities sector. European utilities in the last 10 years have lost some significant fraction of a trillion dollars in market value. It appears to have been caused by the destabilization of pricing driven by the introduction of solar and wind power into the European market. What's so interesting about that is the firms that survived are those that moved into renewables. So we know the three utilities whose market values remained relatively high, and they are the three that switched. So this case in general is quite powerful, and as I say, I could talk a lot more about it. But one, you can talk yourself into at least a few firms seeing an individual business model. I don't think, however, that the individual model is near enough to take us where we need to go. Some externalities are genuine externalities. Education, in particular, is very hard to deal with, or health, or democratic governance, very hard to deal with as an individual firm. So one reason these firms moving into these individual models is potentially so interesting is they rapidly come up against their limits. So I talked about the case of Nike, whose immediate response to the, um, to the scandal around child labor was to say, well, we'll fix our own supply chain. And it became very clear very quickly that you couldn't fix your own supply chain because it was everyone's supply chain. Similarly, Unilever, which moved very early to um, invest in sustainable palm oil, worked out pretty quickly that, no, we have to have lots of friends. Otherwise, there's no way we can make this work. Partly that's driven by the need to make these costs what might one might call pre-competitive. So let me put this in kind of simple terms. I want to pay my workforce more. 
But if I pay them more and nobody else does, they will put me out of business. So, big idea, why don't we all pay our workers more? Why don't we all stop imposing forced overtime and harassing the women and doing these horrible things that are happening in the supply chain? If we can all do it, we won't lose our competitive edge and we will protect ourselves from significant brand and regulatory risk. So what you're seeing is in a number of industries the emergence of what's called self-regulation. Coalitions of firms saying, okay, I won't pay off the locals if you don't pay off the locals. I won't uh, throw my, water, my stuff into the stream if you don't throw your stuff into the stream. And the, that's accompanied with, but of course you need this, metrics, audits, and sanctions. Because what we know about self-regulation of that type is it's not very stable. The temptation to defect is quite strong. And indeed, it's that temptation to defect and the fact that it's hard to pull together these coalitions that then takes us to the third step in the, in the theory of change, which is you're working on this. In the case of palm oil, they have every major Western consumer goods company signed up to buy sustainable palm oil. So for example, I was with the uh, strategic uh, planning manager for Pepsi, and I said, so tell me about sustainable palm oil. I, I see you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. He said, yeah, brand damage. You know, the, brand, the Pepsi brand, unbelievably valuable, got to go to sustainable, the risk is too high. If, if Coke does it too, then I'm on much better ground. The trouble is, even with all the Western consumer goods companies, you only have 60% of the industry. You still have a lot of trouble on the ground. It would be really nice if the Indonesian government started thinking about this. In the case of labor supply, a lot of the Western firms have come to believe that if the locals would start enforcing the labor laws, and the mining companies have come to believe if the police behaved well and we had enforcement of the local uh, human rights laws, you know, everything would be better. And so they discover on the ground and in real time that, whoa, institutions are not so bad. What's interesting is one can look at the recent election and the response of the private sector and say, whoa, we're even seeing that, you know, not in the developing world, we're seeing some, some uh, business leaders in this country going like, whoa, I hadn't, you know, government regulation is really helpful. You know, a well-working democracy, really, really helpful. So that gets you to all kinds of collective action and engagement. And that's what brings me to this idea that purpose-driven firms might be critical catalysts in this process. So what is a purpose-driven firm? I define a purpose-driven firm as a firm that's willing to spend real money in public in pursuit of a goal that is not profit maximization. So for me, you're not authentic unless you credibly commit resources to doing the right thing, at least from time to time. For me, that's the definition. Now you might say, well, how does a firm like that survive, right? If it goes out of its way to pay its workers more, or if it goes out of its way not to employ child labor, and it says that's because we're purpose-driven, surely that invites the very competitive problems I've been talking about. And here I want to briefly orient you to a very exciting stream of research that's been happening in multiple fields over the last five to 10 years. Um, you should know that scholars in organizational behavior and organization theory have believed for many years that so-called high commitment or high road or high integrity firms are likely to be significantly more productive and creative in many situations than their more conventional rivals. So my suggesting to you that, no, this really might be the case, is not a new idea for someone who's spent a lot of time in organizations. What's new, I think, and this reflects my own background in economics and engineering, is that we've been able to both look at the microdynamics of this in the lab, in psychology and behavioral economics, and we now have macro-level data which is consistent with this story. So let me alert you to two particular pieces of data that I think are fascinating in this context. The first comes out of work that has been conducted in the area of productivity based at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a wide variety of, of universities, trying to understand what makes some firms more productive than others. We have suspected for a long time that some firms are better managed than others. When you look at the data, Firms in the top decile of productivity are on average in every major industry where we have good data as much, on average, about twice as productive as firms in the bottom decile. 
That's with the same capital, the same labor, or controls for capital, controls for labor, controls for prices, controls for product mix. I spent 20 years in conference rooms where people refused to believe this result. For a long time, we thought we just didn't have the right data. It was something, it was some kind of unmeasurable effect. Let's control for management quality, whether they went to MIT or Harvard. I'm not making it up. That's a real study. Um, you know, what must be driving this? And we have, in some ways, reluctantly, but also excitedly come to believe that these differences in productivity are the very least tightly correlated with differences in the adoption of so-called managerial practices. Again, I could go into more depth here, but the intuition is that we pretty much know there's a better way to manage the firm. It involves high trust, work groups, communication, high integrity, treating people with respect, doing continuous improvement. Again, I'm telling you nothing new. This is what Toyota brought to the Western world. What we have now is data from thousands of firms across every major nation showing that the correlation between these practices and productivity is very robust. This is work by John Van Rienen and Nick, uh, Nick Bloom and my own colleague, Raffaella Sedan. It's brilliant work, and I would recommend it, you to it if you're interested. But we're now sure that this is real. And now the question is, well, if it's that easy, why doesn't everyone adopt these practices? The first level response is, well, it must be some difference in competition. The firms that are holding back are those that are in uncompetitive markets and they're just hanging out and having fun. Why bother to, to do these new practices? That turns out to explain a very small proportion of the variance. The second idea was, well, maybe it's information. Maybe people just don't know these practices are good. And that does indeed um, appear to explain an important amount of the variance in the less developed markets. So if you look at the distribution of managerial practices in, say, India or China, it, there's a huge kind of lower tail of people that to us look as though they have just no idea what they're doing. And that's probably information diffusion. But what's puzzling is even after you control for that, you still see very slow diffusion of these practices. And I myself, for example, have written on General Motors and why they, you know, they knew that Toyota was doing things better years ago. And it took them 25 years to shift. And this is despite more than 300 books written about what Toyota was doing and at least 4,000 academic articles. So what the heck is going on? So my own personal explanation, and this is joint work with my colleague Bob Gibbons at MIT and the subject of my sort of pointy-headed peer-reviewed research, is that what's going on is some firms can build what economists call relational contracts and what everybody else calls trust. That is, it's one thing for General Motors to turn to its employees and say, I read this paper. It says that if I treat you with trust and respect and we form collaborative teams that do joint learning, we'll both be richer. What do you say? And in essence, my work with Bob is that making that speech is not sufficient to persuade the American auto workers that General Motors means what it says. And indeed, when you look at General Motors history, you see this pattern of they say it, it takes them about six months to change their mind, everybody decides, okay, they are bastards, back to square one, um, and you can't adapt, adopt the practices. So our belief is that this variation in diffusion is importantly driven by variation in the ability to build relational contracts. And I believe that that is correlated with the embrace of purpose or integrity that managers who display a strong sense of mission to something other than their personal wealth maximization are much better positioned to build these kinds of contracts. And that these contracts are fundamental to high performance. I also believe they're fundamental to driving innovation. Again, this is my academic work over many years. But I've come to believe that the single thing that enables firms to go through these kinds of discontinuous or disruptive transitions is the belief that they want to, to be emotionally committed to doing things differently. Because if you're driven merely by profits, you're not going to do it. I've worked with hundreds of firms trying to move through these transitions. There are, of course, lots of things we could talk about in the way you do strategy, in the way you structure your organization. But without the ability to handle uncertainty, without the ability to trust each other, without the ability to take risks and see the bigger system, it's very hard to make these transitions.
And purpose-driven firms are much better positioned to make these transitions. So as I said, I think there's good reason to believe that purpose-driven firms in some circumstances are both more productive and more innovative than their more conventional rivals.